Cool, yeah, so I'll get right into it. Um, my background isn't in like neuroscience or cognitive science. I did my PhD in statistics with a focus on machine learning. Uh, I sort of joined the CogSci world only a year ago when I started my postdoc uh, in Princeton with Tom Griffiths. But uh, the reason I started my postdoc in, in sort of a CogSci lab was because we had similar interests, which is how to efficiently learn things. And, you know, we talked about it sort of using different language. I talked about it in, in the statistical language, machine learning language, and he talked about it in this sort of human-oriented way with a lot of Bayesian terms thrown in, but we, we found a lot of common ground. Um, and so that's, that's what I want to talk to you about today. I'll save the mining stories for another time. Uh, yeah, I usually do a motivation here. But I think sort of the previous talks we had today already kind of motivated why we should be uh, uh, figuring out how to work with small data. Uh, you know, we had Kevin tell us that uh, a useful map is a small map. Uh, we had Jonathan tell us that if you want to sort of efficiently learn like a manifold of different theories, then you don't want to do this unaffordable number of comparisons, pairwise comparisons. You probably just want to do a small number of comparisons to some kind of benchmark. Um, and then we had Michael tell us that sort of one of one of the bottlenecks he faces in his work is data availability. Uh, so, you know, these these aren't exceptions. This is actually a rule like most people have small data. Uh, you know, for researchers, it's expensive to gather more data. Sometimes there just isn't more data. So if there was a way for us to leverage sort of recent developments in deep learning and and enable people who don't have access to millions and millions of rows of data to, to make use of that technology, that'd be great. Uh, so today, uh, in, in sort of in that direction, I want to focus on a few questions. Uh, these, these are questions that, that sort of drive most of my research, and these questions are, first of all, how can we make our data sets smaller, but still contain all of the relevant or important information? Uh, how much or how little data do our models need in theory? How much or how little data do humans need? That's sort of a recent question. And finally, how can humans uh, help better supervise our models? So, how can we make our data sets smaller? I don't want to like build a lot of suspense. I'll tell you the answer. We can do it the same way that we make our models better, that we train our models. It's by using backpropagation or any other optimization technique. And so let me guide you through that, right? So um, imagine we're in a supervised learning setting, right? This, this is typically what supervised learning looks like in machine learning. We normally have a bunch of data. We feed it to our model. We give it labels and the model needs to learn some kind of function. Uh, when we want to restrict that and, and find out how our models are going to perform when there's little data available, we start to talk about these few shot or one shot settings, right? Where we say, what if you only have a few examples of the digit three or like a few pictures of a cat? What can you do in that case? And then, you know, the most extreme one we have is one shot learning where we say, well, what if you have only one picture per example? Can you still learn to recognize cats and dogs and wolves and whatnot? Um, and so, you know, the goal is how in this, in this one, if you have this like large data set, how do you make it smaller, right? How, how do you transition over to this like few shot setting while still preserving performance? How do you transition over to a one shot setting and still preserve performance? So to do that, let's take a look at how training normally happens, right? So this, this is roughly speaking what supervised learning looks like. We have an image, we have this label next to it. The label says, this is a five. We tell that to the model, the model says, I don't know, it kind of looks like a one and a six to me. And we say, no, you're wrong. Here's a loss. Update your parameters to get better. This is actually a five. All right, and we keep optimizing this. We update the model parameters and eventually uh, it gets better at saying that indeed that's a five. In 2018, there's this cool algorithm proposed called dataset distillation. And what the authors of dataset distillation said was, what if instead of back propagating the loss to the model, we start with some like random noise instead of an image and we say this random noise, we eventually want it to represent the number five. So we're going to train a model on it. We're going to test the model on real data to get sort of a surrogate loss, right? We're going to get a loss in real data and we're going to back propagate that loss through this double loop that we just did to the original data itself, right? To the input images, to the actual pixels. 
And we're going to update those pixels so that if we were to train our model on these updated pixels, uh, the model would have better performance on real data. Right, makes sense. So instead of updating model parameters, we're actually updating pixel parameters and we're updating the image itself. And so um, early in my PhD, what we decided to do was see if you, we can sort of uh, um, make that a little bit better, right? We said, what if, what if instead of saying that this thing, this, this patch of random noise should represent fives, we kind of relax that restriction. We say, okay, there's, there's like a soft label associated with it. It's a probability distribution over the possible classes, digits of zero to nine. And we back propagate the, the loss, not just to the pixel parameters, but also to the label parameters. Right, so we allow the, the optimization process to update both of the pixels and the labels associated with the pixels. So I said, what, what can we do in that case? And it turns out that you get something that looks like this, right? This, this is handwritten digits. On top of each one, we have like logits associated with top three classes. And you get, if you have just 10 of them, you get these like kind of prototype -y looking things, right? You get sort of this, this thing that looks like a zero, this thing that looks like a one. But crucially, we're, we're not just telling our model that this is a zero, this is a one. We're saying, hey, this is a zero that has like some facets of the number nine or some facets of the number five. So we're, we're providing this kind of soft label information. Okay. So um, let me see if I have the motivation here for that. Yeah, so I'll try, to, I'll try to motivate that a little bit for those who aren't too familiar with deep learning. Uh, I'll, I'll go towards like K-nearest neighbors literature. It's a little bit easier to visualize what's happening in data set distillation. So in K-nearest neighbors literature, uh, the, the main problem that you know, users face is that you have this large data set, but you have this really lazy algorithm. k algorithm is really lazy. It doesn't actually train. There's no like fitting that it does. You just throw training data at it. At test time, it finds the K-nearest neighbors uh, and then makes inference based on that. And the problem is that if you have a large training set, it's going to be really expensive at inference time to figure out what those nearest neighbors actually are to the point you want to classify. And so what people do is they say, okay, well, what if we create prototypes that are going to be representative of a particular class? And then at inference time, we need to find only the nearest prototype. We don't need to find all of the you know, nearest points out of all of the training set. We just need to find the nearest prototype. And then we can do a classification. So you get something like these, right? Like these three black points, each one could be a prototype, you know, one for the red class, one for the blue class, one for the green class. At inference time, you say, which of the black points is closest to me? The problem is that when you start uh, trying to tune this, you start moving these prototypes around, you have very poor control over the resulting decision landscape, right? The decision boundaries, first of all, are linear, but second of all, as you change which point you're selecting to be your prototype, you start to get these big jumps in what the resulting decision boundaries look like. So then there's a whole second set of literature that says, well, these prototype selection algorithms, they're so hard to tune, they're not great, but what if we relax the assumption that data needs to come from the true distribution, our sample distribution? What if we say that our prototypes can come from some other distribution? So basically, what if we say that we can just like pick a point in the space and call it our prototype, even if we haven't actually collected a sample at that point in the space? And so what happens is that you still have linear decision boundaries, but you have much finer control uh, over what that decision landscape looks like because you can move these points around. What we're dealing with now in this like soft label data set distillation cases, we're saying, well, you know, before we were saying that every prototype is associated with just one class. What if we relax that assumption to and we say that you can inject a little bit of information about the other classes into each prototype. So what you're seeing here is that the, the prototype for the green class, we're injecting uh, information about the red and blue classes into it. And that's starting to create these nonlinear, fairly smooth uh, decision boundaries. And so once you combine that with prototype selection, you get you know, quite fine control over the decision landscape. Right, so this, this is pretty much sort of the, the best you can do in terms of uh, designing prototypes. But what we found is really, really cool about that is all of a sudden you can do this thing, right? Where you say, I have two points. I'm going to give them information about you know, the, the classes they already represent, 
and I'm going to start adding information about some kind of third class into both of those prototypes. And so what happens all of a sudden is that when you disentangle the soft labels of these two points, right, when you perform the classification, you induce a third class in between the other two classes, right? So two points, two, two prototypes, three classes, two training examples, three classes. And so when we go back to our soft label data set distillation work, and we said, okay, well, you know, let, let's see what happens if we go below 10 images for MNIST, right? So we have 10 <laughs> digits. We think we need 10 images to represent 10 digits. We say, well, what happens if we reduce the, that number of digits? We keep the optimization process, reduce the number of digits available, or the number of images available to the model. And it turns out that you can actually sort of solve MNIST with fewer than 10 images. You can train models to over 90% accuracy for classification given just five of these distilled images, soft labeled distilled images. Okay. So this is pretty cool and it sort of gives us a little bit of insight into the answer to our next question, which is how much data do models actually need? And it seems like the answer might be that we need fewer than one example per class. So at this point, we said, okay, let's, let's propose this sort of new regime below one-shot learning. We'll call it less than one-shot learning or low-shot learning. And let's try to study it and, and figure out how it works. And so we designed some, you know, KNN machinery to, to attack it uh, analytically because it's a little bit hard to study things with, with deep, uh, deep neural network architectures. But, you know, this, this is what we saw before, right? You have two prototypes. Uh, they create three classes. The third class is sort of induced in between the other two. And we said, well, what, what other fun things can you do with that? Well, for example, if you have like points arranged sort of in a polygon with a third point in between them, you can do the same thing where you pick pairs, right? You pick uh, every outer point and pair it with the inner point, and you induce a third class in between each of those pairings. And so here you're getting two M minus one classes with M prototypes. You get, you know, this, these sort of interesting geometric arrangements uh, uh, that, that can work with this. And then we said, well, you know, you can try something else. You can do like neighboring pairs in a polygon. You can combine the previous two ideas and get into three M minus two. And you can like keep playing around with this and then inducing the third class between different pairs. Um, but there's also something you can do to get a more qualitative jump. And that is, you can actually induce more classes in between just two points, right? So you can go uh, uh, with two prototypes and induce four classes in between them. And as sort of the main theorem we have in this paper is that it turns out that with two points, you can induce any finite number of classes between them. Obviously, there's constraints on the geometry. so. You know, roughly speaking, the result is that if you have uh, uh, n plus one prototypes, you can induce any finite number of classes in n dimensions, right, in an n-dimensional manifold. So you, here you have two prototypes inducing any finite number of classes in a one-dimensional manifold. Cool. Um, I'll briefly go over this. So we said, okay, let's let's try to turn this into a real algorithm and see if people can use it in practice. And so we made this thing we called uh, K nearest line classification, where we said, you know, let's let's find lines in data sets and let's replace all of the prototypes along those lines using just two points, right, the way we did it over here. And then let's just store the lines and whenever you want to do classification, you just need to find the nearest line to you. So that's that's basically what's happening here. Um, what, what's a little bit more interesting that I want to get into is that you know, we, we still had one more restriction that we were working with before. And that restriction was that our soft labels actually have to be probabilistic, right? We were saying that uh, uh, we had these nice little pie charts where, where all of the probabilities add up to one, they're all positive. So the soft label really is a probability distribution. But you don't actually have to do that, right? Your, your classifier, your model doesn't really care if you have a valid probability distribution or not. And you actually get really interesting behavior when you start to violate that uh, constraint. And so here you, we can show that, you know, you can create any number of these ellipses uh, when you use these sort of just three points arranged in this, in this, in this way. Um, here's an example of where this becomes a little bit interesting, a little bit useful is if you, take a look at one nearest neighbor 
algorithm and you say, you know, what are the optimal prototypes we can generate if we have data in the, in the shape of circles, concentric circles, what can we do in that case? It turns out that like the number of prototypes you need to perfectly separate the space is quadratic. Right? So it's like n squared in the number of circles, the number of classes you have. With the soft labels, you need a fixed number. You need five of them and that can induce any number of these circles that you want. More importantly, in the one and n case, you have these, these strange linear decision boundaries, right? They don't really match the underlying space that well. You have a lot more control over the, 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 the landscape, the boundaries, when, when you start working with soft labels. Okay, so hopefully at, at this point, I've convinced you that like, if you use soft labels, it seems like that might be the key to, to doing this kind of like less than one shot learning thing in models. And the next question we posed is, you know, well, if it works in models, at least theoretically, does it work in humans? Right, so the theory we're now operating on is that perhaps humans can also do this less than one shot learning thing. And maybe the, the mechanism that allows humans or would allow humans to do that uh, would also be soft labels. So to, to test that, um, we thought about, you know, how, how could this mechanism work in people? And we had this little analogy, little story that we told, which was that imagine an alien zoologist comes to Earth and the alien zoologist is like unfamiliar with local fauna. Um, and humans tell the alien zoologist that they need to go and catch a, a unicorn. Um, but, you know, they don't know what a unicorn is. There's no photos of a unicorn. So instead, humans show the alien a photo of a horse, a photo of a rhinoceros. And they say, this is a horse, this is a rhino, unicorn, you know, something in between. And so now the alien zoologist with just two pictures recognizes three different animals. Probably, right? Except maybe there's actually like this, this rhino corn animal that, that exists and maybe that confuses our alien. So there probably needs to be some careful mechanism for you, how, how you actually do this less than one shot learning, right? How you, how you work with these mixtures. Uh, so well, this paper is actually published now. So we have a, a paper where we try to address that. There's this long text of like how we do it, but roughly speaking, what we say is, okay, look, there are dinosaurs. Here's a dinosaur fossil, you know, work with me here. This is a dinosaur fossil. It has genetic information associated with it. Uh, some paleontologists found a bunch of dinosaurs at a new site. Genetic analysis is really expensive. So they only analyzed two of them. And they found that these two dinosaurs had a uh, um, genetic relation to three other dinosaur species, right? Three existing known dinosaur species, or maybe an unknown, three unknown dinosaur species, sure. And so here we say, you know, the dinosaur one, dinosaur two, these are the ones that were analyzed. Uh, a, B, C are these like hidden dinosaur species, and this is their genetic relation to that. We say, okay, great, here's a new dinosaur. What species do you think it's related to? Right, so effectively, what, what under the hood is actually happening is we have this like manifold of dinosaurs. We assign soft labels to two of them and show that to the participant. And then what we want to see is how is the participant now going to split up the space, right? So like, what are we inducing? What posterior are we inducing in the participant? And so uh, it turns out that uh, the participants or, or humans actually do some kind of less than one shot learning. So they manage to disentangle these soft labels. Um, so what you can see here is like data averaged over participants where they're doing this classification thing. And I mean, really the key to pay attention to here is this uh, SLP 13 where you see the, the three peaks, right? Like, I mean, you can read the paper for, for more information about it, but really what you're seeing here is that they were shown two examples, but uh, internally they inferred three different classes from those two examples. So we collected a whole bunch of data. Um, but I think what's, what's more interesting than like looking at this data is, is talking about what, what does this tell us about humans and how humans do this less than one shot learning. And so to, to talk about that, we turn to um, sort of the two most common models or theories of, of how people do classification, right? And one of them is prototype theory, where we say like, oh, people see stuff and then they create an internal, they imagine a prototype and they refer to that prototype whenever they want to do classification. And the other theory is exemplar theory, which says, oh, you know, maybe you remember like a bunch of different examples of the things you've seen. 
and you do basically nearest neighbor search to those exemplars, and that's that's how you classify things. Um, so you know, previous studies have have shown that like prototype theory, but you know, back in the '80s, exemplar theory was all the rage, and that's that's what people thought was the the top model. More recently, people have shown on, on large, very large behavioral data sets that really prototype models win out. But the theory for why prototype models win out is because it's more efficient to store a prototype. So if you're seeing like hundreds of examples of horses, it's probably a lot more efficient for you to store one of them than for you to store dozens of them. So in a big data setting where you're seeing hundreds of examples, it makes sense for prototype theory to be better. But we're not working in a big data setting. Right, we're sort of in the exact opposite setting. We're saying we have so few examples that you don't necessarily even have full coverage over all of your classes. What did people do in that case? So we compared the, the sort of human results that we had against prototype uh, models, various exemplar models. Here's sort of a little summary of that. And, and essentially what we find is that even in the small data setting, people seem to prefer to use uh, the sort of prototype method. And that's really cool because what it tells you is that when people see soft labels, when they get this entangled information about classes, what they actually do is they disentangle that information. They mentally create a prototype for each of the classes that was entangled in those soft labels. And then they use those mental prototypes to do classification from there. Okay, so this answers our idea of, you know, humans can do less than one shot learning. Um, this is maybe the way that they do it. We're sort of developing more studies around it at a larger scale to figure out uh, what, what the limits of that are. But that brings us uh, to the last part, which is how can humans better supervise models? Because it looks like humans can do this extremely efficient form of learning. Um, models can do it too, but we don't actually have an effective way right now of creating labels for models in such a way that models will, will learn in this less than one shot regime, right? In theory, it should work, but we have no way of actually making that happen yet. And so that's really the premise of this, this uh, final thrust. And the, the answer hopefully that we're starting to get to is that humans can do this by sharing our rich representations with models, right? So, so far, what we've argued in this talk is that normally this is how we supervise our machine learning models. We say this thing is a platypus. It's not a beaver, it's not a duck. But what we probably want to do, based on what we've seen so far, is somehow give a soft label where we say, yeah, you know, it's a platypus, but it also has features of a beaver, it also has features of a duck. And in some sense, you're actually lying less to your machine learning model when you present data in this way. Because yeah, that thing does look like a beaver and it does look like a duck. The question is, how do you get there? Right? Like if, if you were to look at this picture, it'd be a little bit difficult for you to say like, yes, this is exactly 60% beaver and 30% you know, beaver, 60% platypus, 10% duck. So there's a few different ways to, to move from hard labels to soft labels. Um, there's, there's some papers that argue for label smoothing where they just say, oh, you know, what if we like chop off some of the confidence that we have in this being a platypus and reassign it to like being a beaver and a duck? But that turns out to not be actually all that helpful. Um, a couple of years ago, Josh Peterson had this paper about crowd labeling where they said, what if like each image that we have, we have, you know, 200 people label it. And then when people make mistakes, you know, that talks about their uncertainty of which class this belongs to. And so we can use sort of that, that human uncertainty as a soft label. But it turns out this is like super expensive. You're not actually saving anything. Uh, you know, you need 200 labelers per image and you're relying on misclassification. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can show that crowd labeling works in our experiments too, but you probably don't actually want to do that. The, the more recent one we've been looking at is what we've sort of called probability probing, probably needs a better name than that. Um, but the idea there is that you ask people how typical uh, a, a particular image is of a particular class, right? So you say, how well unscaled, like without looking at the other classes, how well does this image correspond to what you think a beaver is? How well does it correspond to what you think a platypus is? Right, people give you answers on like a Likert scale. And then if you, if you really need a probabilistic label, you can push it through a soft max, you get your probabilistic label. 
And so, you know, we have some findings that show that like you get way more entropy out of this, you get way more sort of information per dollar. Um, so this is probably a pretty nice way to do that. And that brings us sort of to this, to this next idea, which is like, okay, we, we can actually extract soft labels out of people. So could we set up an experiment where people actually teach in this less than one shot regime? So you have a teacher who has access to a bunch of classes, a bunch of exemplars. The teacher needs to, as efficiently as possible, communicate with a student via prototypes so that the student can recover all of those classes. And so what we're exploring is whether, you know, whether people not only can learn from these like mixed soft label examples, but whether people can also teach via these mixed soft label examples. Am I on time? We're, we're a couple minutes, right? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll use the break. So Perfect. So, yeah, I mean, the, we have this. We have this experiment. This is this is starting to run. Uh, the answer seems to be that yes, people can teach this way. Makes sense, given that people can also learn this way. Um, but again, the, you know, the, the key there was that that soft labels don't have to be probabilities. We don't need to ask people to give us a valid probability distribution. Uh, there's different ways to do it. And so one of those ways, it might be familiar to those of you from a cognitive science background, it's by looking at similarity judgments, right? Effectively, when we did this probability prob probing thing, when we were saying like, how similar is this thing to a beaver? How similar is it to, or how typical is it of the class of beavers? Really, we're asking for similarity judgments. And so similarity judgments have this like long history in cognitive science of being used for representation uh, um, recovery, let's say, right? People have some kind of like internal psychological model of the things they perceive. You can't actually get people's hidden embeddings out. Uh, I mean, maybe the neuroscientists disagree with me, but you probably can't get people's hidden embeddings out. So you need some way to figure out uh, the geometry of, of, this, of these representations in their head. And you know, Shepard going back 60 years said, okay, great, we'll, we'll just use similarity judgments to do that. Uh, the problem, as Jonathan was saying today with pairwise comparisons is that they're super expensive, right? You need N squared pairwise comparisons for N images or N, N stimuli. Uh, so some recent work we did on that front started with, with work by, by Josh Peterson, where Josh Peterson basically said, okay, well, you know, what if we like, don't collect human similarity judgments and instead of we turn to our favorite deep learning models and we just like compare the embeddings and deep learning models and see how well they match humans and the answer honestly was was that you, you can get some degree of performance just by using deep learning models but it's honestly not great and then you can do all sorts of transformations but you're probably overfitting if you do that so to summarize it, like, it's very cheap, but it's also a, a very rough approximation of human similarity. If you were to just like take two convnets or take, sorry, a convnet or uh, uh, run over two images, take the embeddings, and, like do a cosine similarity. So that, that's like a pretty poor approximation of, of, of human similarity. So uh, our idea there was, you know, when, when humans are doing these similarity judgments and we're, we're talking about classes and then doing all of this, like what we're probably doing is uh, using representations that are somewhere pretty close to our language representations. And so our argument there was, you know, what, what if instead of asking people to give us all of the n squared pairwise similarity judgments, we just ask the people to give us the n language descriptions of each stimulus, right? So we basically like get captions from people. Uh, you pass it through the language model the same way they did it through the vision model, but that's where you compute the similarity. And so it turns out that it's actually quite good if you take these language models, they're like, given enough data, they're, you know, the, the, uh, the, you get the ON data, they, they end up being like decently better than vision models. Um, with a few exceptions. So over here, we have this sort of analysis of like, where are their failure modes of different models? So in the first one, uh, this is this thing called, on the left, we have a picture of something called Celtis, which you know, I only learned about while doing this experiment. On the right, we have seaweed. And so a vision model says, oh yeah, these things are similar, great. 
Uh, and then this CNNB model, it's based on tags and like there were people in, in the tagging database who actually knew what Celtus was. Uh, so they said, oh yeah, you know, like this is Celtus, this is seaweed. We ran it through a language model. Language models, like obviously these things are different. Clearly Celtus and seaweed are not the same. Uh, but most humans who performed this task didn't have that prior knowledge uh, and they thought these things looked similar. And so you have like similar failure modes Personally, my favorite one is this one on the right. Uh, my colleague came up to me when he got this result and he said, Ilya, um, you know, language models, they know that a horse's butt and a horse's face are similar, but vision models don't. So that's, that's sort of a failure mode there. Um, I mean, the, the rough conclusion from that paper was semantic similarity was highly correlated with visual similarity. We've since then really scaled this thing up. We said, okay, great. Let's do this on audio, images, video. Let's use like, let's test, you know, hundreds of different deep learning models, dozens of different language models and figure out sort of really what the limits of, of this framework are. And at the result, the result of that was, was this guide that we came up with, which answers to, to people in the cognitive science community, the machine learning community, how should I collect some layer data, right? Depending on like cost constraints I have, and the uh, uh, quality sort of of the approximation that I'd like to receive, what should I be doing, right? And that's really the aim of this, this, this thrust in our program. It's to answer to people, how should I be supervising my model given cost constraints to maximize performance? And so we did something similar with soft labels and hard labels. I think I won't go through it for the sake of time, but basically we said like, in the context of representation learning, how much information do you get from soft labels versus hard labels? Let's do a cost benefit analysis and provide this to people so people can conduct their own cost benefit analysis. And basically here you can see, you know, under different utility and cost functions, would I prefer in my case to be using soft labels or hard labels? So to summarize what we talked about today, right? We said that we can make our data sets smaller by optimizing over them the same way that we optimize over our models. We then try to probe the limits of how small our data sets can get such that models and humans can still learn from them. And we realize that both models and humans can learn from less than one example per class. And then finally, we looked at ways in which humans can help models actually achieve that lower bound by providing richer representations. And that's sort of the main thing that we, we evangelize and we build tools for, right? Our argument is if you're collecting data, collect the richest representations that you can collect within your cost constraints. Maybe it won't be useful for this particular task you're solving today, but down the line when you're, when you're reusing this data set, that's, you know, you're going to be thankful that you did that because once you start doing representation learning, once you start trying to learn other tasks, that is what's going to get you the performance you need. Um, lots sort of coming out of this next, lots of applied stuff, lots of theory. My, my main point of the slide is to say that if there's something here that you find interesting, come chat with me. We love collaborating. Uh, would love to discuss possible ideas. Thank you guys so much. And, you know, big thank you to all of my collaborators across the many institutions. Thanks.